to use Apollo or not to use Apollo? That is the question. <laughs> hey, what's going on? Uh, this is Dispatch This, using Apollo Client 3 as a state management solution. Just welcome to the talk, honestly. I'm really glad to have you here, and uh, hopefully this is useful for you. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm going to tell you who I am. Uh, I'm Khalil Stemler. I'm a developer advocate at Apollo, and uh, I help developers level up with Apollo, GraphQL, and TypeScript. I'm also very passionate about software design principles, best practices, and I'm working on this book that's about these things. It's, uh, it's essentially the tool I wish I had when I first started out at my first professional job as a software developer. And when I'm not reading, writing, or coding, uh, I'm usually working on music, sometimes with the cowboy hat on. Um, why? Uh, I don't know, just some things are unexplainable and awesome. And so, uh, you know, we could just leave it like that. <laughs> Speaking of awesome, um, you know, that's a great segue into the rest of the, the talk here. So I'm just going to dive into this and um, let's see what we've got here. So if you're coming into client-side state management in 2020, we have a lot of excellent options right now. We have Redux, React Context, and Apollo Client. How do we decide which one of these to choose? And I think in order to even answer that question, we first need to ask ourselves, what is it that we need from a state management solution exactly? Well, I think the, the first thing is obvious. We need state, of course. We need somewhere to store some data, and that may include working with remote data that we need to pull in from somewhere. It may include some local state, some stuff that's not in a server, and we may need the ability to combine them and have pieces of remote state and local state work together on the client side. Then we need to be able to update state. And lastly, we have this concept of reactivity. We need some way to notify the pieces of our UI that rely on state that it has been changed and that they should present some new data. So ultimately, I think these are the three pieces that you would expect from a state management solution. And the great thing is, each one of these can get the job done. Yeah, you know, they might have slightly different ways of how they're achieved in each approach, but the high-level goal, the storage and state changes and reactivity, they're all realized here. So, you know, that doesn't, like, that doesn't really help us a whole lot. We still need to figure out which one we, we need to use. And, um, you know, I think it's important to realize that state management is complex. And, you know, if you talk to someone who's used Redux, there's, there's no doubt about that. The state management code can account for around 40 to 60% of a project's code base. To better illustrate where I think all the work goes, let's look at a 5,000 foot view of what I believe to be a generic architecture for most client-side apps. So the first thing we start out with is presentational components. You know, they don't really do a whole lot other than present. And presentation components often have UI logic. Render this if you're logged in, otherwise render this instead. So UI logic is, you know, responsible for doing something with data that's coming into a component or creating user events in response to things like button clicks and hover states or key presses. Next, we have our container components. And I know a lot of the industry has moved away from calling these container components. We need something to enable reactivity, something that knows how to get the data from the store. And we need something that knows how to take those user events from the presentational components and connect them to the right place. Whether that be a React hook, a service, a Redux thunk, or an action creator, the job of the controller is to act as the glue in the middle that stitches everything together. And, you know, this is a talk about the store, right? So how does a store come into play? For example, when imagine we have a to-do app and we were working with to-do objects. When I click edit to-do, it's possible that I may need to reach inside of the store in order to run some logic that decides what we do next. And I like to call that logic interaction logic. And this is code that's initiated by user event contains the preconditions that govern when an operation should be executed. And you know, sometimes that operation that needs to get executed is something like a mutation. When a mutation goes out, then we start getting into all this infrastructural stuff like 
fetch logic, and that contains things like creating the payload, assigning headers to the request, and specifying the resource location, and state management, and shaping the response into the format that the client needs it to be, and attaching local variables, and merging data, and all this kind of stuff. And finally, we need to connect the new data to the UI, so we need it to flow back through to the presentation layer using reactivity. So if you look at this, you'll you'll actually see that you know this is around half the work. We can kind of see that visually here, right? And at Apollo, we gave a name to this stuff. We call it the data layer. And the data layer holds arguably some of the most challenging tasks that we have to figure out how we're going to address on every client application. And using a bare bones approach like Redux or React Context, you might find that creating the same infrastructure and solving the same problems in every app can be pretty time consuming. So the Apollo Client Library handles the entire data layer. And that's really cool because now we don't have to worry about this stuff. This is like developer productivity plus plus in a way. So if you decide to use Apollo Client, you start out with all that challenging data layer stuff already addressed. And you know, here's the rest of the stuff that you still have to do. And these things are pretty important. And these are the things that actually makes your app special. So you can't just pull this off the shelf. I wanna say that there's about three steps to getting started with Apollo Client at this point. The first step is configuring the cache, and that very well just might be to connect to a GraphQL API. Then we need to query for the data that we need. And then the third thing is we write the mutations to change the data. So this is great. Apollo Client gives us a set of APIs to configure, fetch, and update our client-side state out of the box. We just got to learn the APIs. In Apollo Client 3, we've introduced a bunch of different improvements to each part of the library. So I just want to say uh, the rest of the slides in this talk will be based on a simple to-do app that I've put together on GitHub. It shows how to use the new AC3 features and how to build different versions of a to-do app using local state, remote state, and even the old local resolvers approach. That will still also work. So this is the first thing we normally do. Here's how we might set up the client and the cache. First, we import them. Then we can create the cache. And then we create the client, telling it where to find our graph and giving it an instance of the cache. With this basic setup, we can actually pull in remote state using queries and we can make changes using mutations. We don't need to do anything special in order to get up and running with this. So. One of the first things we could do is pull in a collection of some data. So we do that by asking for the data we want, writing a GraphQL query. And we'll come over here to a container component and we'll import the query. We'll import the use query hook from Apollo client. We'll pass that into the hook. And you know, we might want to handle some of these async states. And then finally, we can pass the data into the presentational component so that it can render it to the screen. And that might look something like this here. So maybe it's a good idea to understand how this data is normalized and what it looks like in the cache. By default, Apollo Client uses the type name and ID fields to uniquely identify data. So what you're looking at right here is just you know, it's just a printed version of what the cache looks like internally if we were to fetch all these to-dos. It's relevant to know how the cache works a little bit because it'll affect us when we actually get into writing mutations. So in this next pattern that we'll explore, creating a new item, we can do so by writing a mutation the same way that we wrote a query. There's a small important thing to note here though. See where we're asking for the new to-do? We are including the new item that's going to get created in the mutation response. Because when we do this, the cache is smart enough to identify that something was brought in and then it will proceed to normalize it and cache it as well. So in a component, what we could do is import the mutation, import the use mutation hook, pass the mutation to a hook, again, handle some async states, 
and then we hook this directly up to the presentational component. And let's see what this looks like. If we're looking at our to-do app and we say add the fourth to-do, it looks like it didn't get added for some reason, right? So now is about the time that I would take off the cowboy hat and put on the debugger hat and go over and look in the cache and see, you know, what is it that's actually stored in here directly. So we can see that we have all of our to-dos in here. We have to do one, two, three, and ah, interesting. Do you see that? There's to-do four right there. It's normalized and it's saved on the cache, but for some reason we're not seeing it render in the UI. And that's kind of weird, right? Ah, but you see this right here. This is this is a very fundamental aspect. It's that it's not being saved in our cached collection of to-dos. These are actually references to to-dos that are stored flat on the cache. And the to-do number four is not actually in this array. And you might be asking yourself why, because I was certainly asking myself why. Cache makes no assumptions about how we want to update cached collections. When we did the query to get all to-dos, we created a local copy of some of those to-dos. When the cache sees new data coming in that it hasn't seen before, it will always normalize it. It'll always go through and do that uniqueness thing where it computes that and puts it flat onto the cache, but it won't assume how we want to use that new data to modify our existing cached collections. And you know, this is actually a good thing because mutations and deciding how our existing collections are stored on the cache and how they should change, I think these are all application-specific operations. To Apollo Client, all it knows is that we've invoked a mutation. It doesn't know the specific behavior that we'd like to carry out. You know, only we, the developers, know this. For example, an add to do operation adds to the end of a list a remove to do splices that object from the array and an edit to do will update you know that to do in place in the array i think this is a pretty small price to pay for abstracting pretty much the entire data layer you know we don't have to think about a lot of things but we do need to tell apollo client what behavior we want it to take when we're interacting with these cached collections after our mutations and the way to do that is using this update function. So if we go back to our mutation, we can pass in an object as an argument so we can define an update function. What we want to do is add the new to-do to the existing array of to-dos that was saved as a cached collection. So to do that, we'll pull the new to-do from the response and we can use an API called read query to execute a query to get the existing to-dos from the cache. And then we'll use the opposite, which is write query, to pass in the query that we know we want to set the new value of, the get all to-dos query, and we'll give it the new data, which of course will be an array. And this time it's going to be of all the to-dos that were there before, in addition to this new to-do that we've just added. So let's take a look at that. And voila, there it is. Our to-do is not only saved in the back end on our server, it is also being displayed on our client side and re-rendered here. And to just really drive this home, if we go and we look at the cache again, you could see that that to-do, the fourth one, is also in our cached collection of to-dos. When we're writing this update logic, we generally recommend you use the read query and write query APIs. With these, you can accomplish about 95% of what you'll ever need to do here. But with Apollo Client 3, we also released a new set of advanced cache manipulation APIs. And you can check those out on our lovely, lovely docs. So now I would like to move over and talk about local state management. And I said this is my favorite part of the new AC3 release. So, you know, we're phasing out local resolvers. They will still work and they'll still continue to work in AC3, but we have a new approach that we're using. And that new approach is called cache policies. With this, for a particular type and for a particular field within that type, we can modify what the cache returns before reads 
and before writes to the cache. There's a ton of features packed into this thing, but I'm most excited about the fact that it introduces cleaner patterns for local state management, things like pagination, pipes, and filters, and other very common things that we just need to address when we're building client-side apps. Here's an example of a very common pattern, you know, initializing a default value. So here we have a cache policy, and on any instance of the person type, on the field name, for that field name, when this is being read from the cache, if there's no value already, we'd like to set it with the default value of unknown name. Otherwise, we'll return it with the value that it already has. This is a very basic example, but there's a new feature that cache policies can be combined with that makes local state management a lot more enjoyable to work with. And that feature is called reactive variables. Reactive variables are containers for variables that we would like to enable cache reactivity for. This means that when we change the value of a reactive variable, it'll notify the cache and it will also trigger a re-render if you're using React. Let's say we wanted to build the entire to-dos app from scratch using local state only. It's a lot easier to do that now. So maybe first we'll define the structure of a to-do type and then do some more data modeling on that and then we'll set up what we want the initial value to be. In this case, an array of one to-do seems appropriate. Next, we will create this local variable here called to-dos var using the cache.makeVar function. And we could also pass in the initial value that we wanted to have at the time of creation like this. Now, if we go over to our cache policies, we can hook it up by saying, hey, on this query type, anytime we ask for all to-dos, this to-dos field, we are going to return the current value of the to-dos var reactive variable. And this will give us the most recent value of the to-dos var. And this is also how we connect reactivity up to our cache. So if we go over to another part in our app, we can query for these to-dos. So in Apollo Client, the way to tell the cache that we want to try to resolve certain types of data from the cache and the cache only is to use the at client directive. So now this will only ever attempt to pull to-dos from local state. Then we could do the same thing that we've done before with queries. We pass the query into our use query hook and fetch that data and give that data to a component to display. Now to update this, to, to perform some operations here, instead of doing mutations, we have a lot more say over how we want to update state with our local variables. The truth is, you know, we could do this however we want. We could use simple functions. In this example, we have a delete todos function that when composed with our todos var reactive variable, it'll give us a function that enables us to delete a to-do from local state using the ID. So first, we can invoke todos var, and that will give us all the todos. Then we can filter by the ID to create a new list of todos without the one we're deleting. And then we could save the todos var reactive variable and trigger a re-render by passing it in as an argument. So again, and you know, in case you're sleeping here, <laughs> it's these cache policies and the reactive variables used together that gives us a much better local state management story. And I think that's pretty cool. So we've just went through a lot of stuff. We learned about the three basic pillars of state management solutions. That's to hold state, to make it possible for state to be updated, and to make sure that things are reactive. And we also learned that we call this the data layer, at least at Apollo we do. And this can be pretty complex to build and maintain. So that's why we want to do it for you. We want to give you the tools that enables you to focus on the stuff that actually matters. And if you use Apollo Client, there's three things you have to know how to do. And that's configuring the cache. Then we got to fetch data, both local and remote data, using queries. And then we have to mutate data, and we could do that using mutations. And, you know, understanding a little bit about how the cache works under the hood is helpful because now we've traded in building this entire architecture for knowing how to use some APIs that handles it for us. I always recommend that if you're just getting started, stick with the basic read query and write query APIs to implement your update logic. And if you're a little bit further along, look into the new cache.modify and cache.vict APIs for how you can get a little bit more fine-grained with your control over the cache.
And here's a couple of resources that I found were helpful and you should definitely take a look at. And finally, I just wanted to say thank you and just remind you that you're not alone on this journey. And if you have any questions at any point about Apollo Client, you could always reach out to me or anyone else on the team. We're always happy to chat Apollo with you. And you could find me on Twitter. Even if you just want to hang out, definitely hit me up. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. All right. Hello. Hello. Hi. I hope you enjoyed the talk. We have some time to do some Q&A here. And I see there's a couple of uh, questions. So I'm going to get to the first one here. We have a question from Andrea. Andrea says, does the name of the field returned by the mutation have to be the same as the type name so that it gets cached properly? Yeah, so um, this is an interesting question. I think, um, I think the answer to that question is yes, um, because I know that the way that the cache understands the, um, the way that the cache understands that, hey, this, this data coming back is actually um, something that we know about is it constructs that cache key. Um, there is another way actually now in Apollo to construct your, uh, your very own cache key. Um, I had it in the earlier version of this presentation, but it was a bit much to, to show, but there is a new API um, where you can say, hey, I wanna construct the unique key for this cache using let's say the email and the email plus the ID instead. So you get to define what uniqueness is. And I think as long as uniqueness can be adequately um, understood in what is coming back in the way that it's configured, whether it's by default to use the ID plus the, um, the type name, um, as long as that uniqueness can be confirmed, I think that it should know how to cache that item properly. So let's see here. We got, a, we got several questions. Another one is, what is the difference between cache? Uh, yeah, what's the difference between cache.read query and cache.write query and using cache.modify? And I will say also cache.modify and cache.evict. So yes, this is a great question as well. Um, it's one that I was also asking myself <laughs> a little bit. Um, so yes, uh, cache.read query, cache.write query. Uh, this was this was in in AC two. This was the way that we would um, normally uh, retrieve data from the cache and make changes to the cache as well. And um, this is actually this is also the first way that I learned that this works uh, too. And in Apollo Client three, we now have uh, some more advanced ways to manipulate the cache. We have cache.modify and cache.evict. Cache.modify is this, it's this very, um, it's like a power tool. It's like what we, what we have is we have access to the cache directly. So instead of accessing the cache through queries and writing to the cache with queries, we have the ability to directly say, hey, this particular key in the cache, I would like to change what is stored here, or I would like to inspect what's stored here, then possibly modify what's there. And you could do that with uh, cache.modify. With cache.evict, uh, you, could, you could say, I want to clobber whatever is at this particular cache key in the cache. The, the reason why I, I suggest using uh, cache.read query and write query if you're just getting started is because the cache.modifying cache.evict, uh, it requires a little bit uh, more understanding of how caching or, or how the internal structure of how this cache actually works. And um, if you're just getting started, um, you might not want to have to spend time learning that right away. But if you're familiar with how cache normalization works and what the structure of the cache looks like, uh, definitely take a peek at those APIs because they're, they're chef's kiss. Uh, very powerful. <laughs> um, 
So let's see, what do we got? I'm seeing a, um, oh, there's a quick question here from uh, Kirsten. Kirsten says, well, we have access to these slides, links and notes. Uh, there's a lot of info I want to look back over. Oh, Peggy also already got to that. Yes, we can definitely, uh, we'll definitely put up those uh, slides and, and all the, uh, the resources that we kind of talked about. So there's one more here. Um, local resolvers. Local resolvers allow async operations, but the read policy cannot. Can async be done with cache.makeVar somehow? And that's from uh, Juha. So yeah, well, cache.makeVar is going to, it's going to give you a, a variable that has a, a very limited API, uh, which I think is great. Uh, it's a very simple API. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's similar to a, it's a get and set kind of API to it. So it's whatever you pass in will uh, set the new value and whatever you, uh, whenever you invoke the reactive variable, it will give you a new value. And that is, that's, that's a say, a uh, synchronous thing that you could do. And I think where this question is going is it's, it's, it's asking what kind of, um, or it's, it's asking when we want to uh, change things in an async way, like let's say if we were relying on data from somewhere else, do we have the ability to perform that, that type of uh, behavior with cache.makefar and reactive variables? And yes, I think the answer is yes, because um, they're just very simple containers to variables. So with that in mind, you kind of have full control to um, put, these, put these reactive variables and functions or uh, classes or however you want. It's um, as long as you, as long as when you are saving the variable, you use the, the, uh, the API to just pass in the new value as an argument. I think uh, you should be able to enable uh, async operations around doing that. So to answer that very simply, uh, very succinctly, yes. And it has no uh, constraint on how you organize your async code. And I think we might have time for one or two more questions here. So this one is by Andrea as well. One more question on reactive vars. Are they similar to use state from React? And what they actually do is short circuit the cache when reading and writing. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to think about it. Uh, short circuiting the cache. Um, yeah, because when you when you change state, you want to you want to um, enable reactivity, right? And if you just had a regular variable and you set the new value, uh, it might not tell uh, you, if it's React you're using, it might not tell React, hey, we just changed some data, so we need to re-render. So yes, uh, with reactive variables, uh, they will short circuit um, the cache. And when you save them, they will trigger that re-render similar to what you would do with uh, use state. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting um, comparison I didn't think about. So I think we, we are at time for questions. Um, I will be in a breakout room, an Apollo client breakout room uh, with Ben from the Apollo client team. So you should definitely come check that out later on and we will have some more time to answer questions. And with that said, I'm going to pass it over for our next presentation from Mandy, a talk on federation. And let's, let's check that out.